All right, 1 Samuel chapter number 28. Now, obviously, uh, several months ago, we went through this chapter in detail and covered all the questions that typically come up with this. But I want to focus your attention on verse 3. So look at the beginning of that verse there. It says, now, Samuel was dead, okay? Why is that significant? Well, because Samuel's the one that gave Saul his advice. He would speak with the Lord, give Saul his counsel to go to war. And Samuel's not any longer present. He has gone on. He's up in heaven. Verse 4 says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together against Saul and his army. Verse 5, look what it says. It says, And Saul saw the host of the Philistines. He was afraid, and don't miss this, and his heart greatly trembled. Verse 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. So Saul has all of these issues, all of these problems. He's not getting counsel. He's not able to get uh, communication with the Lord. He's got the enemy surrounding him and he is greatly afraid, which is a terrible thing. Obviously, if you're a leader of a country, look at verse seven, it says, then said Saul unto his servants, seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And this is often referred to as the witch of Endor. Now, why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because the law said that, you know, you shouldn't suffer a witch to live. Right. And it's also a problem because Saul had already gone throughout the land and started to put these witches to death, like the law said. Now, what do we just read here? Saul's got a lot of problems, right? A ton of problems. The title of the sermon this evening is I have 99 problems and a witch ain't one. Okay. <laughs> this is my Halloween sermon because, you know, it's October 31st and I hate Halloween. I think it's an evil Amen. pagan holiday. And so we're going to focus on one aspect of Halloween, which is the witch. What does that mean? What does that represent? Uh, keep your place there if you would, but go to Revelation chapter number nine. Revelation chapter number nine. Now, it's kind of funny how I actually uh, got this title. So I do appliance repairs, what I used to do. And um, I was in a home, a real nice home, fixing a double wall oven while I was troubleshooting it. Okay. Well, Bosch, they're, you know, like the, the main double wall oven in a lot of homes around here. And they're notorious for just doing weird things in the middle of the night. Like they'll just go into self clean, lock up just with nobody touching it. They'll, you know, just go up to 350, lock the door. You can't get it open. It's just all sorts of things. It'll, you know, the display will just randomly, you know, just start putting up different numbers, almost like somebody's selecting something, but that's not happening. And so I'm, you know, really used to this problem. I'm very familiar with it. Well, I go to this guy's house, got a double wall of it. I got it halfway out of the wall and these things are heavy, you know, and I'm focused. I know what I'm doing and he just keeps bothering me. You know, he's a helicopter customer, just constantly over you. And he's listening. It's like a business guy, right? He's listening to rap music and he's listening to a song by a Satanist known as Jay-Z who has a, a, a different song title. I won't repeat it here, but uh, you know, he just keeps saying, I think it's the switch. I think the switch is wrong. That's what it is. And that's why it keeps selecting in the middle of the night and doing all this stuff. And I just said, look, this thing's got 99 problems and a switch ain't one. And he just, his jaw just about hit the floor and he's like, that was awesome. You know, but I picked that up because he was listening to that music in the background. And I thought to myself, I'm going to preach a sermon about that one these days. So I changed it to which just to honor um, our pagan, not so friendly friends that are out there in the community that hate our guts. But that is how that came to be. And uh, basically, when you have computer board issues in these things, it causes all sorts of problems. And, you know, they, they can't just stick with one computer board in an oven now. It's got to be six, you know. And so that's how I came up with the title. So we're going to study uh, witchcraft this evening. I'm going to make this brief because we do have the chili cook-off. I know it smells good, and most people are thinking about the chili and whether or not they're going to win anyways. I know how this thing goes. So I will try to get through this as quickly as possible. But I do think this is very important today because what we're told through culture is that, oh, no, no, you know, which not all witchcraft is bad, right? You got green witches, you've got white witches and it's the black ones, not black people, but it's, it's the dark witches. It's, it's, it's the real ones. Those are the problems. Okay. Look, if you're a witch, <laughs> it, that's a problem. Okay. It's all bad. The Bible's against all of that. It doesn't matter. And just to show you that this is going to become more prevalent in our society as the days go, Revelation chapter nine, look at verse number 20. It says this, so Revelation, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter nine, verse 20. So I mentioned this chapter this morning. This is where God is unleashing hell on earth, okay? 
This is not the tribulation. This is God pouring out his wrath on this planet because of the disobedience and because people hate him. He's pouring out his wrath. He's opened up hell on earth, literally. Look at what it says in verse 20. It says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Okay, so even though God has literally opened up hell on earth, there's plagues, there's torments, there's all of this suffering. They can see him. They still will not change, just like a lot of people today, right? Look at verse number 21. It says, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now go back to uh, 1 Samuel 28. We'll go over a couple more verses and then we'll move on. But I just wanted to read that because it says, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, okay? Sorceries, witchcraft, all of these types of things, this devil worship, necromancy, you know, speaking with the dead, they're all all related okay if you go see a witch you know they're going to be on board with all of that stuff so you know even wiccans will and, I, and i'll tell you a story the first time i ever met somebody who claimed to be well he said i'm not a witch because witches pertain to females he says i'm a warlock you know and you know i'm like okay that's that's a lot better you know <laughs> good job you're glad you're not a witch you're a, you're a warlock but uh, um, the bible would call him a wizard okay same thing somebody who believes they can do magic and cast spells and do all this stuff but uh, he goes what religion are you so i'm working with this guy and he's asking me you know what religion are you and i already known this guy was weird he had really super long hair he always took halloween off just a bizarre individual if you were to walk into a room and you were there you would sense evil okay and he you know he's well, what religion are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm just born again. You know, I'm a Baptist. And he's like, oh, you're on his side. I will never, ever forget how he looked at me. He said, oh, you're on his side. And I was like, what about you? Kind of already knowing. And, and that's when we got into the wall. I'm a, I'm a warlock. You know, he's a, I'm the high priest of uh, the Midnight Crystal Coven. That's what it was. The Midnight Crystal Coven in Port Orchard, Washington. And he started to get into, you know, all the stuff that they do. And everything that he described to me that they do is witchcraft that you read about in the Bible. But he's like, I'm a good witch or I'm a good warlock, right? No, no such thing whatsoever. So again, one more time, look at verse number three there. You're in 1 Samuel 28. Look at verse number three. It says this. It says, now Samuel was dead and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had very important, that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land, okay? So one of the things that we can learn about witchcraft or wizards, whatever you want to call them, is that they can somehow acquire or they have, they possess a familiar spirit. And you say, well, what's a familiar spirit? Well, it's something that witches have, okay? So when you hear somebody say, I think you have a familiar spirit, you know, what they're saying is you're a witch, okay? And that's not okay. Okay, you don't have a familiar spirit. You may have a spirit or a devil that it's observing you in what you say and what you do, like we talked about last Wednesday and, and a couple Wednesdays prior to that, but that's different, okay? There's, different, there's a difference between that and somebody who actually consults one, somebody who's gone out of their way to do these rituals and you know, to, to basically summon demon power, if you will. Now, go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 33. So that's the key thing there. Saul went around through the land and he put to death those that had familiar spirits. So obviously they had a decent understanding of what this entailed, what this was, that witchcraft is bad. And they went through and they found people that possessed a familiar spirit and they put them down. You don't have to turn there, but Leviticus chapter 20 verse 27 says, a man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Now I'm not advocating that we take any violent action towards these types of people. That's not our place. That's not our calling because we don't live in these times. You have to understand that God was the Supreme King of this nation. And he's saying, Hey, I'm in charge. I'm running this show here. And this is the law. And you better believe that when the millennium period comes, that will be the law. Again, there's not going to be this coexist tolerant type garbage 
witch running around the face of the earth. Right. No, if you're found to be a witch during the millennial period, you will be put to death. Right. Okay, that is a fact. That is what the Bible is teaching us here. We don't live in these times. We live in a separate nation. We are called to be ambassadors. Right. So I'm not advocating that we go around and harm anyone. However, if the government today decided, you know what, we're going to put these people to death, I would be okay with it because God was okay with it. And if that offends you, that's too bad. That's what the Bible says. That's the heart of God. Yeah. And that will come back into law later on in life. So you're there in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. This is talking about Manasseh. So we're fast forwarding many years now after the nation of Israel had been established. It is now split. You have the northern kingdom of Israel, which has already been carried away captive. And then you have uh, the southern kingdom of Judah and their king is Manasseh. And he started out ruling at a very young age. The Bible says he was a very wicked person. Look at verse number six. It starts to list his sins. It says this, And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also, he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit. And with wizards, he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now notice what it says there in that verse. It says that Manasseh dealt with a familiar spirit. Okay. That's what Saul did. Saul dealt with a familiar spirit. It doesn't say that they had a familiar spirit. A witch, a wizard has a familiar spirit. They have some kind of a connection to the, to the devil or to a devil or something of that nature. Because later on, the Bible t tells you clearly that Manasseh worshiped God. You know, God humbled him and he realized, boy, I've been wrong. <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been a loser. I've been an idiot. And he literally believes on God. And I believe, you know, it's my, this is my opinion. I believe Manasseh was saved. I also believe that Saul was saved. I don't see how you could really argue that. And they both dealt with a familiar spirit. Because here's what people will tell you about soul winning. They'll say, hey, guess what? There's no way that Saul made it to heaven because he had a familiar spirit. That is false doctrine. It says that he dealt with a familiar spirit. Obviously terrible, obviously a bad thing, but it's not the same thing as actually possessing one. So there's something in the Bible that indicates that when a witch acquires that familiar spirit, they literally become the son or the daughter of Belial. Okay. And we don't know the exact details and the intricacies. We don't need to. I'm not going to sit there and read books and books and books and, you know, many, many pages of witchcraft because I'd rather just get what the Bible says. Because when you do that, then the world's telling you what witchcraft is. We don't need their opinion. You know, several years ago when I was at uh, Sure Foundation, in Washington, I preached a sermon called Wicked Wiccans of the West. And to this day, there's always some witch that goes on there and wants to school me and give me this long dissertation of what a white witch is and what a Wiccan is. I don't care. Yeah. I get my definition of a witch from the word of God. And that's what I believe. And that's what I teach. And that's what I'm going to stand by. And that's what this church believes. And that's what this church will stand by. Amen. So another thing that I did want to highlight that we just read there, I noticed that it says observed times. Now, is it wrong that we observe holidays? No, I mean, the Bible is clear. If you want to make a, a make an holy day, make it. It's, it's up to you. But there was something that they did even back then to where they observed times. And that reminds me of October 31st every year, right? Guess what? All the witches, the Satanists, guess what they do? They observe times. And isn't that funny that Satanists in witches, warlocks, wizards, whatever you want to call them, whatever they want to call themselves. Isn't it funny that they all chose October 31st to share that day of evil? I think it was Anton LaVey, right? Uh, that, that said, you know, I'm just glad that Christian parents let their, you know, kids worship the devil one day a year. Because that's what happens when we're partaking in that festival, in that holiday. And you say, oh, I don't agree with that. You know, that's fine, but that's what it is. Halloween has some horrific horrific roots in these pagan rituals and stuff. And I talked about those last year. I don't want to get into that. I just want to stick with witchcraft today because I think that that is just very, very important. You're there in Deuteronomy 18. Look at verse number 10. It says this, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. So you could pretty much package all of these things into one, uh, one just, just big ball of evil here. But notice, when God sets up a nation, and he says, I'm the king of this nation, and these are my laws, this is my constitution, what does he say? I will not suffer a witch to live. 
You will not have them among you. You will not tolerate these people. It's not, okay, well, we'll just make good witches and bad witches. That's like saying there's good devils and bad devils, okay? It doesn't work out. It's false doctrine. Look at verse number 11. He goes on to say, or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. Verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. That, look, I didn't put that in there. That's what God says. He says, when I set up a nation and people do these things, I want you to know, I want you to understand, they are an abomination. Look at what it says next. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. That doesn't mean you're going to be without sin. We talk about this all the time. It means you will be complete when you decide, you know, I'm going to have a heart after the Lord. I'm going to actually adopt these. I'm not going to be a snowflake. I'm going to read this. I'm going to accept it for what it is and implement it. God's saying, hey, that is your step towards perfection as a believer, being complete, being whole. That's what we're talking about. Look at verse 14. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. And I'm going to prove to you at the end of the sermon that that is very applicable for today. So keep something there because we're going to come back to it at the end. But go, if you would, to Second Kings chapter number nine. Second Kings chapter number nine. And then after this, we're going to go through 1 Kings and move on from there. But 2 Kings chapter number 9. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, you know, okay, I want to focus just on witchcraft, witches, just for Halloween. You know, just to, just to go after the thing that Halloween seems to really gravitate towards. My first memories of Halloween as a kid were always, you know, the witch hat, right? The pointy witch hat and the broomstick, the lady on the broomstick. Like, that'd be kind of a cool way to get around, you know? As a kid, you don't really understand. You're just like, it just looks like they can travel pretty light, you know? I don't know. <laughs> Seems like you don't have to worry about gas and stuff. I don't know. It seemed pretty cool. It wasn't until later on, you know, that somebody explained to me, no, that's, that's, that's bad. That's terrible. But there is a woman in the Bible, and her name is Jezebel. Right? And the Bible says that she is a master at witchcrafts. If you don't believe me, look at verse 22. It says this. It says, And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So as long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. The Bible says that Jezebel had many witchcrafts. So if you ask yourself, well, what would these be? Go to 1 Kings uh, chapter 16. Well, the Bible is going to list them for us. It's going to explain to us what those are and why God hates that with a passion here. Now, the, the, the only point that I have here actually came from Pastor Mejia because I, I texted him that I had this idea last summer. And he's like, you know what? Your first point could be, you know, if you're having witch problems, I feel bad for you, son, <laughs> because that's the first, like one of the first lyrics of that stupid song. But I thought that was true. You know, and if you are having witch problems, you know, I do feel bad for you. Actually, if you're having Twix problems, I feel bad for you. <laughs> Anybody see that Twix commercial that came out? Somebody sent it to me and it's terrible. I'll just explain to you what it is. So Twix, like many other companies, you know, obviously get their power and their resources from the world and their, their culture from the world. Well, this commercial, um, it starts off with a, a lady dressed up as a witch. She knocks on the door and I thought it was a little girl that answered the door. That's what I thought. Okay. Cause it was wearing like a, he was wearing like a princess dress, but it was actually a little boy. And so they build a little bit of a relationship and, you know, things are all good. And then, you know, this kid's like, oh, I want to go to the park. And so the witch is driving him to the park and the little boy's like, you know, I got my costume on. And, and she's like, oh, do you want to wear it? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, that's okay. So what are you seeing there? You're seeing the connection between witchcraft and pedophilia witchcraft and sodomites that's what you're seeing there that's exactly what you have going on there and so the witch takes this little boy to the park wearing a princess dress and somebody's making fun of the kid right which is definitely what i would have done as a kid you know hey it is what it is you know this is wicked you know people need to be rebuked for this kind of stuff this is where we're heading hey this is where this country's heading here right that is the culture that's being sown in this country and this is why we're going to fall Okay. And so this, this other kid's picking like, Oh, you look like a girl, take that off. And the witch gets mad and, and like does this thing and like blows them off, you know, and, and basically they go off into, 
you know, a, a little happy, you know, ending, you know, the end kind of deal. And so, I, you know, I saw that and I was like, you know, I'm not going to beat people up if you eat Twix, whatever, you know, I don't care. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I feel bad for, for them that they've fallen into this trap and they're going to push that ideology on their employees. Look, that's what their marketing department said. This is what's important for our company, for our nation. It's not about having the best tasting cookie bar. It's not about providing a good little treat. No, now we want to reprobate people. Now we want to push pedophilia and witchcraft on society. Yeah. You know, at some point, you know, there are better alternatives out there, by the way, than Twix. Just saying, you know, you can forgo the Twix. That's my own little personal protest. I'm not eating them anymore. I'm not telling you what to do. You do whatever you want to do. But I hate that garbage. We hate that garbage. God says, you know what? Twix, you, you, your whole organization, you're an abomination. Yeah. Right? What you, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm like, what, what is going on? Oh, that's right. There is no such thing as a good witch. No, they're using witchcraft to destroy societies because that is all that it can do. And you'll see that in the Bible over and over and over again. And so uh, you read uh, Galatians chapter 5, you'll see that witchcraft is actually, uh, what does it say? It's a, um, it's a work of the flesh. You know how it lists all the different works, you know, adulteries, fornications, thefts, murders. Witchcraft is actually listed amongst those sins. So it's a glorification of the flesh, which is why people are drawn to it. Okay, that's why you say, why are people even drawn to that stuff? It's because it's a work of the flesh. That's why. Now you're there. Where are you at? Uh, 1 Kings 16. Look at verse 31. Look at verse 31. It says this. It says, and it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Let's stop right there at that comma. What are we talking about here? Talking about King Ahab. The Bible says that Ahab, obviously a very wicked guy, a very evil king. And look at what it says next. It says that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worship him. See, well, why are you reading that? What is the significance there? Why is that even important? Well, it's important because what did Jezebel do? Who won whose influence there? Did Ahab, who was born and raised in Israel, did he win over Jezebel? Uh-uh. No, he didn't. Jezebel stirred him up. Jezebel won him over. And if you don't believe me, go to 1 Kings chapter number 21, and you'll see the truth there. So we can see that witchcraft today does exactly what it's designed to do. It leads people away from God and into the devil's playground. It's not just, look, witchcraft's not just about, okay, just reject God and do your own thing. They'll, they might tell you that's what it is. No, it's about actually worshiping the devil. It's about actually becoming a son, being a born again devil. That's what witchcraft is about. That is their goal. That is their aim. And I'm not saying that Ahab was a reprobate, but nonetheless, her influence really messed that nation up. It messed Ahab up and it was a huge problem. Look at verse 25, first Kings 21, look at verse 25. It says, but there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. You know, another thing that Samuel said about witchcraft, he said for rebellion, and he was speaking to Saul when he said this, he said for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So witchcraft is what? We can say, well, it's just like rebellion. And that's exactly what you see here. If it wasn't, why would Twix select a witch and the little kid trying to be a girl? Right, because isn't that what this society is becoming about? You could be whatever you want, right? We went from being kids and, oh, you can dress up and be a Transformer. You could be a Mario brother. You could be Luigi. You know, you could be a G.I. Joe guy. To now, it's Halloween 365 days a year. And if you don't want to be a girl, you can be a boy. If you don't want to be a boy, you can be a girl. If you don't want to be either one, you can just pick which day you want to be which one. And that's what it is. Is that confusing? Because that's what it is. That's the way. Hey, welcome to the, the America of confusion. Yeah. And who's the author of that confusion, by the way? It's the devil. That's right. Go to 1 Kings chapter number 18. And so we see that Jezebel, his wife, the Bible says, stirred up Ahab. So the devil used his wife to implement and to institute Satanism into the nation of Israel. And it makes sense. We talked about this on Wednesday, right? The devil would love nothing more than to go to every husband inside of this church and to mess with you and to cause you to fall and to ruin your entire family. That is exactly what witchcraft is designed to do. This is why God said, hey, you will not suffer which live. Because people will say today, well, that's not very nice. They could be saved. When you're a full-fledged witch and you've given yourself over to that, Guess what? You're a reprobate. You are done. You have pushed God too far. And he says, hey, you cannot reform these people. You might as well put them to death. And that's what you're going to see here in 1 Kings chapter number 18. Look at verse number 13. 
So in verse number 13, it says, Was it not told my Lord what I did? This is Obadiah speaking here to the prophet Elijah. And he says, Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And so in this chapter, what happens here is Elijah meets Obadiah and Obadiah says this. He's like, why are you trying to kill me? Because Elijah said, hey, Obadiah, go get Ahab and tell him I'm here. You see, they had been looking for the prophet Elijah for a long time, right? And Ahab was like, hey, if you see Elijah, you better just smoke this guy. You better just kill him. He has troubled this nation, you know, beyond anything we've ever experienced here. We, we want him dead. And here you have the prophet Elijah saying, hey, Obadiah, I know you've served the Lord. I know you love the Lord. The Bible says he loved the Lord. Go tell Ahab that I'm here. And then he comforts him. Obadiah goes and he gets Ahab. And then Elijah, like a true boss, says, hey, I got an idea here. Let's pit my God against the God of your false prophets. And let's see what happens. So he sets up a competition, kind of like a chili cook-off. And, <laughs> right? and he says, hey, you know, why don't you get your 450 prophets of Baal, which means prophets of the devil, okay? And you bring them out here and you have them call upon him and see if he'll save them. See if he'll accept the offering, right? What happened after that? They started cutting themselves and isn't that what Satanists will often do? Do weird cuts on their bodies, markings, destroy the flesh, kind of indicate something. It's letting you know, hey, the devil wants to destroy humanity. Okay. That's why they do that. That is why you see that out here in, in, in the community. That's why you see these people that are, I'm a super pagan. They're proud of it. Their main goal. What can I do today to stick another, you know, thing through my cheek or, you know, whatever it is. That is why they do that. And so Elijah says, okay, obviously your God's sleeping. You know, he's taking a nap. Perhaps he's out to lunch or something like that. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'll up the ante and I'll go ahead and soak this offering here in water. And call upon the Lord. Well, he does that. The Lord licks up the offering in the sight of all Israel, right? Which is what? That's the goal. The goal was influence. You have a battle for influence here. You have Jezebel, her witchcraft, trying to influence people to come over to the devil's side. And then you have Elijah here trying to influence those people to come over to the Lord's side because a lot of the people of the land, they hadn't made up their minds yet. That's why in the beginning of this chapter here, Elijah says, how long halt ye between two opinions? If Baal be God, then worship him. If the Lord God, you know, if the Lord of heaven is, is God, then why don't you just worship him? And they're just like, we don't know what to do. We're not really sure. You know, we haven't been shown all the verses yet. We're not sure which version to trust. You know, and so he says, I'll just settle the record for you right now. He calls fire down from heaven. God takes up that offering. And then look what it says in, um, actually, go to chapter 19. Go to chapter 19. So obviously Ahab's like, man, that was pretty impressive. You know, <laughs> he's like excited about this. And he goes home and tells his wife. And what do you think she's going to do? She's upset that her prophets, 450 people, are now dead. Oh, and by the way, before I forget to mention this, why did Elijah have them put to death? Because they can't be saved. Because God said, suffer not a witch to live. Those were the people that were really troubling Israel. That was God's standard. They could be reformed. They saw the miracle and they still would have mocked him. And so Elijah says, hey, put these guys to death. Don't let any of them escape. But he didn't kill the people that didn't make up their mind, did he? No, he just said, hey, now do you believe? And many of them did, obviously, by reading the text, go on and believe in the Lord God. But you're there in chapter 19. Look at verse number one. It says this. It says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Now look at verse two. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And so there you see the true intent and the true heart of actual witchcraft. It's not about peace. It's not about coexisting. It's not about love. It's about making reprobates. That's why when you read Revelation chapter nine, you have those same people that are committing sorceries and murders. You know, there's no more Christians left. They're still murdering each other. They're still killing each other. And that's why it is still a thing to be even mentioned in Revelation chapter 9. After all the plagues, after hell on earth has commenced, they still won't stop. They won't change 
from their sorceries, their witchcrafts, and all of that stuff. It's the same thing you read in 1 Kings chapter 18, when the people saw the miracle that God did. When the, I'm sorry, when the false prophets, the prophets of Baal saw the miracle that God did. They weren't impressed. They didn't care. You see that same spirit in a lot of the Pharisees and in a lot of the Sadducees and even a lot of the scribes during the time of Christ. And Jesus said, hey, you know, the reason why I'm speaking to you these things in dark sentences is so that you can't be converted. John chapter 12, go look it up. So uh, go back to 1 Kings 21, 1 Kings chapter 21. And we will wrap this up here, be done in a few minutes, and we will get on with the chili. 1 Kings chapter 21, look at verse number 9. It says this, so this is what Jezebel does. It says, okay, I got to give you the, the context here. <laughs> So after the events of Elijah hiding and, you know, God basically setting the record straight and getting him back on track, Ahab decides, you know what, there's this real nice vineyard that I would like to have. The only problem is there's this guy and his name's Naboth and Naboth has possession of it. I went to Naboth, right? This is what he's going to tell Jezebel. You know, I went down there, I offered him a real good deal. I told him, you know, I'd buy it from him for this much and he still rejected it. And so like a little baby snowflake, he goes and he's laying on his bed and he's just a little upset and his wife comes in and like, what's wrong with you? And he explains to her, Naboth won't sell me the vineyard. And she's like, aren't you the king? Aren't you the ruler of the land? Verse number nine. So she institutes this plan to destroy Naboth. But look at this here in verse nine. It says this. It says, and she, that's Jezebel, and she wrote in the letters. So she sends letters to these devils. And she wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. So let's stop right there. What she does is she sets up a little bit of flattery for Naboth to catch him hopefully off guard. Look at verse 10. It says, and set two men, sons of Belial before him to bear witness against him saying, thou didst blaspheme God and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Very interesting here. Why does a woman who's described as having many witchcrafts in the Bible, why does she seek out two sons of Belial specifically? It's because they're without conscience. Romans chapter one, because they are reprobate, because they won't feel bad for what they're doing. You see, most ordinary people, people that are not reprobates, people that are, you know, saved or lost, right? Let's just say lost for the sake of this example. If you go tell them to do something like this, there's a good chance that their heart will smite them, that their conscience will smite them and prevent them from actually following through with it. She knew that this was a situation that could not fail. She wanted Naboth dead, one and done. She knows the only way to actually carry that out is to make sure that she sends sons of the devil because they have no conscience. They are hell bent on destruction. They cannot be changed. They cannot be reformed. They cannot be saved. And so she says, hey, get a couple guys of the devil, two sons of Belial, have them lie and then go and stone him. She doesn't care about the law of God. She doesn't care if they blaspheme God. Those devils sure didn't care. Right. You starting to see the connection there between witchcraft and Satanism? It's the same thing. It's just another avenue. It's just another tool in the box for the devil to get people to follow him. And you know what? You're only going to see it get worse. Yep. Right now I'm talking about Twix. There's other companies I'm sure I haven't even heard of, haven't even thought of right now that will go down that same road. Now look at verse number uh, 10. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 15. So it says this. Jump ahead to verse 15. It says, And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned, and was dead that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And you know what else this kind of reminds me of? A lot of these rich and powerful people today, money's not enough for them. You know what I mean? We talked about this this morning. It's not enough. Like Bill Gates, the money's not enough. Now they want to take people's lives because they get high off of that somehow. It's sick, it's twisted, it's disgusting. But when you get a billionaire that is without conscience in charge of making policies or having influence of a company or something like that, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna put people to death for stupid stuff, even like this. Over a vineyard, you ruin someone's life. I mean, look, Naboth had a family and now they're without Naboth all because of some witch wanting to please her husband. Think about that. These 
people are in our society right now. They make policies. They're trying to pass laws. They're teachers of schools. They're principals. They work at the grocery store. They go for city council. They're police officers. They are all over the place. And it will only get worse as time goes on. Now go back, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number 18. In Deuteronomy chapter number 18. Because I said I would apply that verse to this sermon here before we close. So Deuteronomy chapter 18. One more time, look at verse number 12. Deuteronomy chapter 18, look at verse number 12. It says this. Again, it says, For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. So because the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, because they were into witchcraft, because they were into all sorts of abominations, God said, I'm going to drive them away. And I'm going to use my nation to do that. Look at verse 13. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations, verse 14, for these nations, which thou shalt possess, hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Go to Revelation chapter 20 and we will be done. So our goal, like I said before, is to be complete in Christ, to be complete in God, to work towards that, to believe his whole word with our whole heart as it is written, okay? Retaining a soft side for witchcraft is not gonna do us any good. You know, a lot of these churches today, they got this trunk or treat deal, right? Trunk or treat. All that is, is a compromise. Right. That's what it is. They're not gonna tell you these things. And it's so sad because they're written down very plainly in the Bible. There's nothing special about me. I just put this together from my own studies and from reading the Bible, right? But when you preach things like this, it's not popular. It gets people very upset. But you know what? At the end of the day, are we gonna be a people of the Lord and believe what he said? Or are we going to be a bunch of compromisers? I mean, what do you want? Right, right. Why do you call yourself a Christian if you just want to compromise on these types of things? You have to realize that that same attitude is what we're dealing with today. We will one day possess the nations that we live in. You know that? Right. We will possess this earth. And Jesus Christ will rule and reign with a rod of iron. Right. And you know what? He is going to drive all of these observers of times. He's going to smoke twigs from the face of the earth. Right. And all of these companies that want to promote witchcraft and pedophilia, and sodomites and all of this garbage. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse number six. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God. This is us. He says, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So we need to rest in that. We need to understand that Deuteronomy 18, it applies to us, but in a different way. We don't execute it physically, but we just be aware of that. And we tell people that. We warn people. We edify one another. We evangelize. And we let people know, hey, guess what? This satanic commie devil system that's being set up that you're so, you know, coexisting with, guess what? It's going to get destroyed. It's going to get blown up. And you might as well come onto, on, onto our side and be saved and just, you know what, draw that line in the sand and understand, you know what, I'm going to stick with what God says because you can't escape it. If you are born again, a Bible-believing Christian, you cannot escape the fact that God will rid this world of witchcraft, of all these abominations, of all of that garbage. You're not going to be, oh, Lord, but just what about this one thing? What about the Wiccans? They're not that bad. What about the Green Witch? I was, I was on Craigslist looking for, you know, a coven around here just to have something funny to say. And there was a post on there and it was like, I'm a mother, you know, I'm 45 years old. I'm looking for a green witch coven for my daughter who's moving to Boise. And Boise doesn't seem very receptive towards witches. Thank God that's the perception out there. If that's what it is, you know, what's a green witch? Anybody know? Is it about all grown, you know, going green, using green products? <laughs> Because that's what it sounds like to me, and I'll bet that's what it is. And it's kind of funny, a lot of these green people, right, these green peace idiots, and yes, they are idiots. Right. You know, those, those people, I mean, they're often into Wiccan, uh, you know, worshiping nature and witchcrafts and all sorts of stuff. When I used to work for the government, they'd come to the gate and have their little signs up, no nuclear missiles, and look, they're out there. It is what it is. But they would be super vile and super rude and have just these, these disgusting signs. You know, and I remember thinking, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this and I'm looking back. I'm like, you know, they're not much different than the sodomites who show up with their signs and love everyone, love everything. And that's pretty much where that Greenpeace garbage is going to get you. Look, there are people that are destroying this earth 
right now. The Bible talks about that, and God says He's going to punish them. He's going to ruin their agenda. He's going to destroy them that punish the earth by, oh, you know, if you want to pay me $30,000, we'll see the skies, and then you can, guess what? You can have a perfectly blue sky on your wedding. You know that's a real thing that's going on? That's witchcraft, trying to alter the weather for your advantage. That is satanic, and I believe that's probably what they're into. Because the last, you know, almost every time I talk to a witch, they're into, you know, green energy. Oh, you know, we only use these certain kind of light bulbs. And oh, yeah, I was also reading on there. Um, like we used to live in Idaho, but we had to move. We moved to Salt Lake City. <laughs> okay. And um, every Halloween, here's what we do as a family, because we don't have, you know, we, we, ha we now have a coven. And, and hopefully these tips will help your daughter. We, uh, we have everything black. Okay, so they have black plates, they cook black beans, they cook all black foods, they turn the lights off, they've got a black cat, which they refer to as a familiar, kind of weird, right, kind of weird, and she's, so she's like, you know, start getting those types of things, start talking about this in the community, try to make friends and get people on board, and, and, and this, um, oh, and, and then he goes on to say this, and then we have a deaf and dumb meal. What does the Bible say about the, uh, these false prophets that peep and mutter and are deaf and dumb, right? He's literally like regurgitating Bible and doesn't even know it, but it's all witchcraft, right? That's what they're doing. That is what you can expect to increase as days go on. So verse number seven, real quick. It says this, Revelation 20, verse number seven. It says, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. See how quickly the devil can work and just rally people up like that? It's like, how are you going to go from the millennium period where Jesus Christ is present, he's ruling, he's reigning, and then the devil's going to come up and like literally turn a lot of those people away onto his side. That's just crazy. Verse 9, it says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them, in verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And this is what the devil knows is coming. You know, he's not gonna, he's not gonna, gonna deny that. He knows that. The devils know that. That's why when Jesus cast out legion, they're like, hey, suffer us to go into these pigs, because that's, <laughs> we, we need to possess something. We need to possess someone. They are hell-bent on that. You know, what do they say? Hast thou come to torment us before the appointed time? But guess what? Deuteronomy 18, that's gonna be reinstituted here. So we might as well start now and just take the stance. Hey, we're not gonna compromise. We're not gonna celebrate. Halloween. We're not going to go out and do any of that garbage. No, we're going to adopt these policies, stand by these as an ambassador for Christ, because this is what's coming on the earth. And I'm going to rejoice when I see the Twix factory blow up sky high and get sent straight down to hell. And I'm going to laugh when I see that smoke of their torment rise up forever and ever, because they're not going to be alone. Right? I'm sure Hershey's be right there with them. <laughs> Nestle, all these other guys, right? And yeah, we have, we probably have Twix back there. I don't know, you know, it, whatever. It goes in and out the drought. That's what Jesus said. Say everything's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Okay. But I still hate that company since I've seen that. I just can't, I hate them. If they hate God, I hate them. Right. That's how we do business. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for this church, for your teachings, Lord. Just pray that you would use us to be an ambassador in the community as you have been, Lord, and help us to just explain these things to people and to motivate them and to set them on fire, Lord, so that they would want to serve you and continue to serve you. Just pray you bless all the food, Lord, that we're about to eat. I pray it would uh, be a blessing to our bodies, Lord. Bless the fellowship after the service and be with us as we go throughout this week, Lord. Please bring us back safely on Wednesday. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.